Hi everyone, um, this is Dr. Saburi. I will be teaching the course Money and Banking. We start with Chapter 1. Chapter 1 consists essentially of two parts. One, one is the six parts of the financial system. Then we will talk about the five course principles of money and banking. In this video, I treat only the six parts of the financial system because I try to keep the videos um, short uh, so that you guys don't uh, fall asleep while you watch them. So. Every financial transaction has a history, we come to that later. What we know is that financial systems are consisting of, a, it's a complex web, it's, a, it's very large and, and a lot of um, things are involved. We simplified it down to six parts. I mentioned them briefly at first and then we will discuss each of them a little bit more in depth. So this, the, the first one is um, money um, that you use for purchasing store and wealth. The second one is financial instruments. What do we mean with that? Uh, again, I will discuss it in depth later, but briefly stuff like mortgages, uh, insurance policies, stocks, etc., that uh, you can buy. Um, those are financial instruments or bonds. Um, then we have the financial market. So, for example, stock exchange places uh, like Hong Kong, Tokyo, New York, Frankfurt, etc. And then we have the financial institutions. Um, uh, as example, you can think of security firms and banks, financial institutions, insurance companies, etc. And then we have regulatory agencies that are government agencies who are essentially supervising the financial systems and trying to keep them stable. Last but not least, we have the central banks that are supposed to operate independently. Uh, we will have a whole chapter about um, the central banks um, uh, later down the road. Um, and their job is also to stabilize the economy. Starting with part one now, money. Money has essentially three functions. The one function is um, uh, is a mean of exchange. It's there to avoid essentially the problems that you have in a barter economy, which would be, for example, the double coincident of ones. So if you have a motorcycle and you want to buy a car instead and sell your motorcycle and there would be no money, you would need essentially someone who has exactly the car that you want to buy and who needs exactly that motorcycle that you want to sell and uh, with whom you can somehow arrange an exchange. That sounds very complicated. It's uh, very difficult to find someone with, with exactly those needs. That's called double coincident of ones that you have in a barter economy. When you have money, you avoid that problem. You can simply sell your motorcycle to whoever wants a motorcycle. And then with that money, uh, you probably need a little bit more money. Uh, so you add something to it. And then you can buy a car that you need from whoever has that car. So that makes things a lot easier. That's the first function of money, which is mean of exchange. There's a second function, which is store of value. Essentially, if you want to uh, save your wealth, if you want to um, uh, postpone your consumption, um, you can put some money aside um, so you can store value. I'm not saying it's necessarily uh, the best way of storing value, um, but um, it is one way and it's definitely the most liquid way so you can you can uh, spend it uh, f faster than for example uh, having your savings in real estate which first needs to be sold which can take weeks or months the third function of money is essentially um, unit of account so if you don't have money your savings for your retirement might be like something like uh, I don't know five cows and 20 hens and a little house and uh, you know things like that uh, how much is it is this much is this not much is this enough it's not so easy to judge that but um, if you have money you can you know see how much is it worth every single item that you have and then count them together and then you see oh, okay I have three and a half million dollars or whatever for my retirement then you can think uh, you know if it's much or not it's much easier that way or also if you borrow someone money um, you know if you borrow someone you know exactly you know what the other person owes you 
versus if you buy a person a cow, then, uh, well, if that person returns with that same cow three years later, well, that's an older cow. It's not the same thing. Those are the functions of money. Historically, money has been um, not always the way we know it today. To today, you know, you're familiar with paper currencies and uh, electronic funds even. Um, uh, that's around. So you just log into your account and... Uh, you see a number, it's in bits and bytes, uh, you pay pal money to someone else, uh, then you lost that money and that other person got money without ever exchanging any physical money. It's, it's only in the electronic form available. Back in the days, uh, money started with all kind of stuff. It, they even used stuff like fish bones of, you know, certain fish as money. They even used like seldomly found stones with a certain shape for example with a hole in the middle that was used as money um so essentially everyone could kind of create money but you know you could just wake up and think should i go and do my regular job or should i just walk in the forest and look for this kind of stone that's very rare and that is used as money so everyone would have the ability to to, to you know create money so but those things have changed um then later came the gold and silver coins if you go in museums uh, history museums you oftentimes find those uh, old gold and silver coins that were used as money, as I mentioned, then later came the paper currency and then electronic funds. You can get your cash from ATMs everywhere in the world. Some countries, even countries that are cut off from the worldwide banking system. So, for example, if you travel to Iran, a Visa or MasterCard doesn't work there. Um, they are cut off from the banking system, but what they have is their own banking system. They have their own debit card system and ATMs everywhere, etc. Uh, so they have essentially built up their own parallel system and other countries as well. So uh, you can get money from ATM everywhere in the world. Bills, you can pay bills and transactions online. Again, as I mentioned, so electronic funds, etc. that are transferred back and forth. So that was money, the first part. The second part of the six financial systems is financial instruments. So you are a saver, you have saved money, uh, and you want to invest it somewhere to get some interest. Um, as a saver, uh, your resources, in this case money, can go to, for example, a company that needs to invest to expand their business, and they are in need of capital. So financial instrument is what transfers essentially resources from you as a saver to investor which would in this case a company that needs to invest to expand their business some examples of financial instruments as i mentioned in the uh, in the first slide was for example stocks and bonds etc so there are corporate bonds uh, you can buy um, bonds from let's say general motors and then in that case you have borrowed money to general motors resources have gone from you from your bank account from your pocket to general motors and you know you get instead interest for that it can happen also that risk is transferred from one person to another person so if you buy for example an insurance policy uh if it's a uh, car insurance you transfer that risk that uh, you know in the event that you have an accident that you have to pay for damages etc from yourself to the um insurance company those are financial instruments uh stocks used to be for the wealthy it used to be very costly to buy stocks so i don't have an exact number but let's say something like 50 dollars if, if it was in the u.s back in the days um so if if buying stocks would be 50 dollars selling stock would be another 50 dollars that would be 100 dollars just for buying and selling then obviously you don't want to invest five hundred dollars or thousand dollars because the transaction costs are very high um, so uh, you, you lose a hundred dollars just by buying and selling stock that's ten percent of a thousand dollars so it's not really worth it for small investors so big investors would buy and sell stocks who would buy for fifty thousand dollars for example and then those hundred dollars um, are become relatively insignificant as transaction costs nowadays it's a lot cheaper um, uh, buying and selling stocks um, it's just a few dollars and if anything and uh, so uh, it, it's attractive now to most people even with smaller investments to buy and sell stocks 
and also we have a lot of products such as mutual funds etc um, it's very diverse we will talk about all that stuff later during the semester now the third one is financial markets that's what you think of as I mentioned like stock exchanges etc where buying and selling of those financial instruments that we discussed in point two is happening is the market where that happens so it started I think one of the first uh, stock exchange places was essentially like a tavern in Amsterdam where they where they traded the first stocks and um, now things are very different it's uh, huge uh, companies essentially um, that are those very well organized markets like Deutsche Börse which is um, the German um, stock exchange place or uh, New York Stock Exchange etc those are big companies very well organized um, highly connected etc it's very different than the tavern that we had in the in um, in uh, in Amsterdam some 300 years ago or so now transactions are mostly handled in by electronic markets that's one reason why transaction costs are so low because you don't have those middlemen who are as you have seen probably in some movies doing those wild gestures for buying and selling stocks etc it's handled everything electro electronically per computer in milliseconds very fast very efficient um, and that has reduced the cost of processing them so uh, many people have now access um, to those financial instruments pretty much everyone because the costs are so low number four are uh, financial institutions so um, don't mix it up with number three financial markets so like the stock exchange places number four the financial institutions that's something like um, a bank an insurance company etc so they provide all the services of the financial system so for example if you need access to the financial market so you need for example a mortgage uh, where do you go you go to your bank and they provide you with capital and the access that you need um, also another fun function that's pretty important is gathering um, information so again going back to that um, mortgage example the fund whoever is giving you the funds uh, need to know some information about you you know how reliable are you as a mortgage taker how how high is the possibility that you're actually able and capable to pay back the mortgage um, or if you think of another example you want to get an insurance well they want to also see how risky are you as an insurance buyer so they need to gather information about you when it comes for example to car insurance they look into your driving driver history etc and that function of gathering information is also done by financial institutions whether it's a bank or an insurance company etc nowadays banks offer a lot of products it's like a financial hypermarket you can say you, you, you can do anything pretty much in, in most bank banks offer a very wide variety of products number five is the government regulatory agencies they make sure that the financial system is running safely and re reliably they were they were installed in the 1930s after the Great Depression. So the Great Depression started in the late 20s uh, around one famous uh, negative highlight uh, of it was the the crash of the stocks markets in 1929 and it went uh, for a couple of years into the 1930s. Um, that's the Great Depression when we talk about the Great Depression, it's about those times, uh, almost a hundred years ago. When we talk about the Great Recession, however, um, that was about the year, around the year 2007, um, 8, 9, 10, etc. That was uh, the financial crisis that we had. Uh, it's a lot more recent. That's the Great Recession. Um, so something important for you guys to distinguish. Anyway, the government regulatory agencies were installed after the Great Depression and um, after the Great Recession, however, they did some additional uh, changes into it because they saw that the regulations that they have wasn't sufficient. Uh, apparently, um, the, the financial crisis was a proof for that. So they implemented 
things like the Dot Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act. Um, more recently, President Trump has reverted some of those um, uh, reforms that was done, uh, parts of that act, but nonetheless, uh, so it's a government regulatory agencies are there to make sure uh, that financial markets are run safely. They, they supervise it essentially. Another part of the financial system that has kind of a similar function is the are the central banks. Um, they monitor and stabilize the financial system. You hear it all the time in the news, like the Fed decides to increase or decrease the rate. That's always big news. Central banks are supposed to be separated and independent from the government. Um, they are um, supposed to do their own thing. Um, they are not supposed to be influenced by short-term political intentions, etc. Their function is to monitor and stabilize the financial system. They have a couple of instruments in their hand, for example, the interest rates, as I mentioned, but also they can, as they call it, pump money into the economy, uh, as it happened after the Great Recession ten, in, uh, around the year 2009. They started to pump $85 billion every month into the economy, into the U.S. economy, essentially printing money. That was about a trillion dollars per year, um, which you can see the effects probably if you look into that it did help the economy to bounce back but at the same time it also inflated the prices for real estate and stocks the central banks began as large private banks to finance wars um, the first uh, uh, kind of central banks was actually founded uh, a few hundred years ago already I believe it was in the 17th century if I'm not uh, wrong um, but nonetheless, it's more of a newer phenomena, generally speaking. Uh, I believe it was in the, uh, at the year 1900, there were only 18 central banks in the world, and the U.S. was not one of them. We did not have a central bank back in 1900. The Fed was established later um, in 1913, respectively 1914. We will talk about that later. So these are the six um, parts of the financial markets. Next thing, we will talk about the five core principles of money and banking in the next video.